Good evening, everyone. Um, we'll begin shortly. We're just waiting for Senator um, Boxer, Barbara Boxer, to get on. She was here and somehow got knocked off. So just give us um, a moment um, and we'll begin shortly. Should we put our name and maybe our city in the chat just for oh, fun? Hi. hi, everybody. We'll get started in one minute. Um, you can put your name in the chat if you want and where you're from. Um, just give us one minute. Thank you. Can you guys hear me OK? It's Barbara. Oh, there's a senator. Yes, we can't yeah. hear you OK. I didn't see where you were. Um, but yes, we can hear you. Um, you know what, we're going to get started since you are here, Senator Boxer. Um, I, have, I have about 35 minutes with you. And okay, I, perfect. And so we're going to begin perfect. now. I'm Jill Zippin. I'm chairwoman of Democratic Jewish Outreach Pennsylvania and one of the co-chairs of the Jewish Battleground Coalition. Noah, Arbit, one of the founders of this coalition, is going to start us off. Go ahead, Noah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Great to see you all here. Um, thanks so much for being here. I don't know about where you guys all are, but in Michigan, it is nice and like in the high 80s. And so I'm really enjoying my first Zoom ever outside. Um, as Jill said, um, I'm Noah Arbit. I'm the founder and chair of the Michigan Democratic Jewish Caucus. And we all banded together to found the Jewish Battleground Coalition last summer to um, assist the effort uh, to uh, kick Donald Trump out of office. And so we're continuing that work um, alongside the Florida Democratic Party Jewish Caucus, Jewish Democratic Women's Law in Atlanta, with led by Valerie Habit, um, Margie Feldman, who's leading uh, our uh, contingent in Nevada, um, Rosalie Weisfeld, who I'm very happy has uh, been a big part of this uh, this event, this effort, the chairwoman of Democratic Jewish or Texas Democratic Jewish Caucus, and uh, Richard Schwab, uh, Linda Frank, and Marvin Tick, who are leading the Wisconsin Jewish Democrats. So we are really excited. Um, to talk about this really important issue, which has been in the news so much, and um, which I know uh, a lot of people have a lot of strong opinions on, this the filibuster rule in the Senate, something that you know there, I could think of no one better to talk about this, especially to a Jewish audience, than uh, Senator Boxer. And we're so grateful to have her. Uh, thank you so much, Senator. Um, so, Jill, I'll turn it back to you. You're muted, Jill. Yes. Hi. Um, Linda Frank from Wisconsin um, has the pleasure of introducing Senator Boxer. So Linda, why don't you take it away? Well, thank you. When I moved away from Wisconsin in 1998 for 17 years, I left the state with two Jewish senators, Herb Cole and Russ Feingold. I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area and not only equaled that gift, but surpassed it with two Jewish women senators, Diane Feinstein and Barbara Boxer. The Senator's political career began with Maroon, Marin County Board of Supervisors for six years. She served in Congress for 10 years, during which she and a group of other Congresswomen protested the all-male Senate Judiciary Committee, Committee's treatment of Anita Hill during the Supreme Court confirmation hearings of Clarence Thomas. Senator Boxer served in the Senate from 1992 to 2016, when she was succeeded by now Vice President Kamala Harris. Report cards for Senator Boxer's political service range from 100% rating from NARAL and the League of Conservation Voters to an F from the National Rifle Association. She voted against going to war in Iraq during the George W. Bush administration. Her special concerns while in office included children, youth, and families, education, the environment, foreign relations, health care, and electoral reform. Since leaving office, she has become co-chairman of the public strategy firm Mercury based in its Los Angeles office. When I read up on Senator Boxer's non-political life, I found we have a few things in common. We both worked as a stockbroker and a journalist and have published novels. 
Unlike her, however, I was never a cheerleader, which she was at Brooklyn College. But I think we all have much in common with Senator Boxer and resonate with the slogan of her first congressional race. Barbara Boxer gives a damn. And I'm so honored to welcome her to tonight to this event. Thank you, um, Linda. So there's just been a little shift um, in what's happening tonight. Wendy Davis is very ill and in the hospital with a virus, not COVID. So we are very lucky to have um, State Senator Jose Rodriguez from Texas with us tonight. So thank you for filling in at the last minute. What we're going to do is since Senator Boxer has to leave um, at 7.35, we're gonna do Q&A with her. Then Rosalie um, will introduce Senator Rodriguez and then we're gonna do some Q&A with him. So why don't we begin um, Senator Boxer, if you want to say a few words about the filibuster, and then we can engage in some conversation. Surely. Um, first, I, I'm just thrilled to be with you. I, I just want to say thank you to those of you in these tough, tough states. And by way of, um, you know, just urging you on, you should know that when I came to California, it was quite red. And then it turned quite purple. <laughs> and it was only after I was in office for a while, it turned blue and now it is bright blue. And I think um, the reasons are clear. Uh, if you believe in hope and opportunity and fairness and justice, I don't think you have much choice. I'll get into that in some of the questions. Um, and I hope you'll ask me about just anything you want. But for about five, six minutes, I'll talk about the filibuster because it's an interesting conversation for us to have because for years I defended it. And, um, and, and toward the end of my service in the United States Senate, I left when Trump came in, that was fortunate for me, um, I, I changed. And the reason I changed was we could not get any judges through, any Obama uh, judges through, and it was just impossible. And so I said, okay, let's change it for judges, but I said, not for the Supreme Court. And Harry Reid said, Barbara, Barbara's right. We did not change it for the Supreme Court. And you know, the minute he could, Mitch McConnell changed it in a heartbeat. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten stuck with the ones we now have there. But um, because I changed on it, um, I think I have, there's value to that. Uh, I saw it as a way, you know, to really protect some very important values such as civil rights and human rights and the right to choose and all that because I served when uh, Newt Gingrich was there and I felt if things went wrong, we would, we would literally lose you know, the Bill of Rights. So I, I was for it, I, for legislating, but I changed. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the filibuster because you may or may not know this. Um, I feel it needs to go and uh, there's nothing sacred about it. Uh, it came about because of a rules change. I wanna explain that. Some of you may know this. If you don't, you'll love it because it's quite a story. When Jefferson was president, Aaron Burr was vice president and um, the Senate had a whole lot of rules and the House had a whole lot of rules and most of them were the same. And in the House and the Senate, there was a rule that whenever you had a debate, anyone could stand up and say, I call the question. And when someone said, I call the question, you voted and that was it. And the majority won. Um, and so it was so obvious that Aaron Burr stood up in his capacity as vice president and president of the Senate. As you know, the vice president is president of the Senate as is Kamala Harris now. Aaron Burr stood up and said, look, let's, let's fix our rules. There's redundant rules, there's silly rules, there are rules we don't need, and one of them is call the question. You don't need a big rule about it. Of course we all know, you just call the question. So they did away with that rule to call the question. And somebody discovered it years later and recognized you could just keep talking and the question would never be called. And of course, um, in the 30s, it was used to stop, but, 1830s, it was used to stop civil rights. And that continued all the way forward uh, that it's been used to stop civil rights legislation. But in 19, but remember, 
up until 1917, there was no way to stop the filibuster. There was no cloture, which is a way to stop things. So in 1917, President Wilson talked the Senate into passing cloture. He said, I can't get anything done for the war. I need to have things done for the war. So 67 votes and we'll end debate. And that's how you, you got uh, cloture. In 1975, it was reduced to 60 votes. But the, in order to get that, it ended the talking filibuster. That was the trade-off. So now you could have a filibuster, end it in 60 votes, and you don't even have to have a talking filibuster. So here's where I come down on this. It's time to change it. There's no reason not to. Uh, and I think you change it to end debate at 51 votes. Simple as it gets. Keep it, let people chat, 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 and then bring, uh, bring the, the cloture bill forward. You get enough people and you have a vote. And if 51 people say end debate, end debate. So that's where I am. So in, in closing and getting ready to take your questions, I'm sure they'll be about a lot of other things. What we're seeing here is even the Republican party has gone so nuts and they're so frightening now. They are now filibustering a commission to look into the attack on our country by the domestic terrorists, the white supremacists at all, um, that just happened in January. So now they're filibustering that and going against their own pledge. And I'll close with this. Uh, I do a weekly TV show down here in Southern California. And I, and I remembered, of course, how many times I took office, I took the oath. And the oath says that every Senator and House member and the president, you know, shall protect and defend the United States of America from all enemies, foreign and domestic. It doesn't say, except if Donald Trump tells you not to. It says all enemies, foreign and domestic. The domestic terrorists attacked our nation. Imagine after 9-11 if, if we didn't vote to investigate and they are using the filibuster. So this thing has got to go and how we get it done is another question. So I'll stop there and thank you for all you do. Oh, great. Well, thank you. I'm actually going to start with something that you ended with. Um, you spoke about the House passed this commission to investigate what happened on January 6th. Um, do you think that we will get 10 votes um, in the Senate from what you know of the current makeup of the U.S. Senate? without getting rid of the, you know, if we can't get rid of the filibuster, we're going to need these 10 votes. What are your thoughts on that? Because that's a really pressing issue. My thoughts are we should try to get the 10 votes. I, I can't answer that question. I am stunned at the behavior that I see. Uh, people who, you know, the day after were blaming Donald Trump for this, who were, who, we now have 400 people arrested uh, for, for what they did. Um, people who say blue lives matter um, are going against the, the Capitol Police who are begging us to have this uh, investigation. So I can't predict it, but I maybe could predict this. If we cannot get uh, this vote to come forward, maybe that will be enough for cinema and mansion. I, I don't know. But that you... is, that's my next question. Um, so do you what are the prospects for cinema and mansion changing their mind on the filibuster, particularly with respect to mansion? You must have worked with him for some period of time while you were there. Um, do you think they will have a change in position? And what influence would Senator Schumer have on their change in position? Um, if you could speak to that as well. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm going to speak the honest truth. I don't know. You'd have to ask them. But I would guess at this, if it's something they deeply care about, and I would pray and hope it would be this commission, for God's sakes, th those people, you know, were, I mean, I hate to be gross, I, forgive me, but they were spreading excrement on the walls of the Congress. They, they, they had weapons. They wanted to hang Mike Pence. They were looking to kill uh, members of Congress. I'm 
hoping that if they react the way I do to this, frankly, aiding and abetting the enemy, when you don't vote for this commission, you are aiding and abetting the enemy. If they see it that way, maybe that will be enough uh, to change their mind. I cannot speak for Joe. I cannot speak for uh, Senator Sinema. They will speak for themselves. But I do feel if something touches their heart and they feel this is absolutely impossible, it's they might change. I'm not that optimistic that they will. A technical question about the filibuster. Can the filibuster, can you get rid of it for a specific bill? In other words, for this or say voting rights legislation, but keep it generally? Is that a way around it for, you know, if they feel that say the voting rights legislation and this commission are so important that for these two pieces of legislation, they could um, abide by getting rid of it but not for anything else? Is that a possibility in the way the Senate rules are structured? Senate can do anything it wants, okay. anything it wants. They can override the chair, they can support the chair, they can change, yes, they can. Um, yes, they could do that. It, you know, it's, it's a whole big thing, but yes, they could do it. You know, I've heard people talk about, instead of getting rid of the filibuster completely, going to a talking filibuster. So filibuster reform, say, versus getting rid of it. Um, and I've heard people say they don't really think that will make much of a difference, but there is a difference between speaking, you know, ad nauseum um, and just checking a box. What are your thoughts on that with respect to reform versus abolishing it? Right. Um, I don't think it'd make a darn bit of difference. They could talk all night. I mean, I'm all for it. Go for the talking filibuster because it's really going to annoy a lot of people. And I think it's a good idea, make it, make it a price to pay. Because the one thing everyone wants to do is go home. I could tell you that at the end of the work week. And if you are stuck there, uh, you know, because somebody's filibustering, it puts a lot of stress on them. But at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, they're gonna stand on their feet. The, the, so the two benefits are make it more difficult to do. Um, and also it will call attention to the people who are st stopping everything. Right now, you don't know who to blame, right? Because it's just done quietly. And people, as a matter of fact, just could almost do a secret filibuster. But Ron Wyden changed that. You have to now put your name out there. But uh, so I do think it's a reform. I think that's fine. I don't think it'll be a big uh, difference and yes, you can change it for a certain type of legislation and maybe that's the way to go. Uh, but at this point, as I said to you, for me to see the leaders, the Republican leaders, party of Lincoln uh, say that they don't wanna have an investigation into a full throttle attack on the seat and the heart of our democracy. And the fact that they would put the filibuster behind that, it is, it is bigger than the filibuster. We have to come to terms with what the heck is happening with the other party. It's very serious. And I grew up at a time when, when I was running in the very early years, so many years ago in the 70s, Republicans, my opponents and I were fighting over the same voters, women, minorities, you know, uh, you know immigrants, but in everything. And now, it is totally different. And the party of Lincoln is the party of Trump and it is dangerous for this country. It seems as if Trump has sort of weaponized everything and thus the GOP has weaponized everything, including the filibuster. And the level of distrust in the legislative branch seems high between the Democrats and the GOP. Is there a way that you believe that we can restore trust in bipartisanship? Is there anything that we can do? I know there's a problem solvers caucus to the extent that they're solving problems in the house. Is there anything that can be done given McConnell's continued effort to obstruct legislation? Um, what do you think can be done if we can't get rid of the filibuster? Is there any way to get the parties again working together? 
Well, I think there are individuals who, who work okay with others. I mean, I, I could tell you myself, Jim Inhofe and I passed a heck of a lot of stuff and we never, he thought climate change was a hoax. And I thought it was the biggest threat to, you know, to the world in terms of our physical ability to survive this planet. So we were able to find the sweet spot. Now I'm, I'm optimistic there are individuals, but I'm just gonna be very blunt and why the work you're doing is so critical. It's gotta be the people who rise up here. I mean, they did it by electing Joe, by President Biden by 7 million votes. And they did it because people like all of you on the call said, I'm giving up a lot of time and a lot of my life to make this happen. God bless you for that. And I know I ran a pack as a volunteer and did the same in my way. But um, if, if we don't get the, the people need to see this, we can't allow them to tune out. And we have to tell them the truth. And the truth is not one Republican voted for a stimulus check to be sent out. Not one Republican voted to help, you know, the restaurants and we just had those votes. And the Republicans now, except for a few, but we don't know how many in the Senate and I hope there are 10, I don't know the answer. The leadership of the Republicans on both the House and Senate are trying to stop an investigation into the terrorism that hit our country on January 6th with the intent of stopping the electoral college vote and turning our democracy on its head. And they are still doing these false phony recounts of an election that was considered by the Trump people, the most secure in American history. So the answer is, this is not gonna happen. This kumbaya situation is not gonna happen unless the people let it be known by their voices and when the pollsters call that they've had it with this other group. And, and Do you believe that the um, Democratic Party is messaging in the right way? Is there something about, about the way they message that you would change? Because it, sometimes it feels like even though the Republicans have horrific policies, they don't even have policies at this point, they're able to get their message out there. Um, do you agree or disagree with that? I disagree. Okay. Um, I don't think they have a message. They're, they're about voter suppression. What's the message? Oh, it's voter fraud. Nobody believes that for a minute. Uh, what's their message on this commission that the Democrats are playing politics? I don't think that's working. Y you could be right, maybe it is, but I don't think it's working because I look at Joe Biden's uh, approvals and they're pretty good. They're, you know, Trump never even reached 50 and I see Joe between 53 and 60. He's got the bully pulpit. It's not the Democrat party, it's really him. And of course, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer uh, working in tandem, but it's, you know, the Biden administration has been hit with a lot of issues, as you know. And uh, I think they're doing a good job one foot in front of the other. What Mitch McConnell came out and said when there was a discussion about the filibuster, you get rid of the filibuster, I'm going to make your life hell. You know, we're going to restrict abortion and voting and, you know, you name it, they're going to restrict it. Um, what is your response that. to that? What's your response to that? Well, he can't do that. The court, Supreme Court, can. what does that mean? He can't do it because he doesn't have the majority. What he's basically saying is if he's the the leader. Yeah, that well, that's he, what I meant. If they were to come into power again. And he'll pass legislation to ban abortion. They've done it a hundred times to Sunday. They've already done that. You know, they've already done it to us. So I, I you know, in every way that they can figure out. So I, I don't think those threats are, are real. I, I think, and again, someone who, who did feel we should keep it for legislation, I think that day has come and gone. And we have got to just take these battles as ugly as they get. Yeah, he's gonna do it if he became the leader, but we've got to stop that from happening. And if you, if the issue is a woman's right to choose, most people support it in most circumstances. So he's not uh, telling us anything new, but, but I, I'm saying to you that, you know, focusing on the filibuster is fine, but I don't think, and this is just my view, 
to go out with the message on let's get rid of the filibuster, people roll their eyes. They don't really know what it is. Forget it. We have to go out and say they are blocking us from doing a commission. They're blocking us from getting you, uh, you know, the George Floyd Act. They're blocking us from doing immigration reform. They're blocking us for, you know, helping get your kids help with their student loans. They're blocking us from helping you and they're using an old fashioned way of doing it. But, but I don't think people are gonna vote for us because we wanna give, because we want to do away with the filibuster. It's good for us internally, we're sophisticated and we understand it. But please, when you go out door to door, don't be telling people vote Democrats because they'll get rid of the filibuster. You know, say vote Democratic because we care about you. Every aspect of your life, we care about your kids, your grandkids, the air you breathe, the water you drink, you know, your freedom to choose and all of those things. And guess what? They're blocking it because they don't have the support. And we've got to, we've got to make sure they don't have the voices in the Senate and House. And we've got a midterm and I, I know we're getting toward the end, but I'm sure you probably asked me this, but I just want to say to all of you activists here, bless your heart and stay with it because this midterm is so critical. We shouldn't even call it a midterm. We should call it the next great election. We have to defy history. History is against us. History says we're going to lose everywhere. We cannot allow it to happen because it's not an ordinary time. What we have at stake here is democracy itself, voting itself. Um, you know, life itself in the streets for, for our black brothers and sisters who are getting uh, uh, killed. And we've got to reform the police. We have so many things to do to make life better for people. I just hope that our message when we do get out there is about, you know, the people, not us. It's about what you need people in order to live a good life and have, have that opportunity and that fairness and the healthcare and everything we need. So I know you will do it, but I don't want us to get caught up in technical issues like the filibuster, it won't work. So I agree. The message is that the Democratic Party stands with the people, um, but it's an important issue to think about in terms of getting legislation obviously, uh, you know, through. But you're absolutely okay. right. And for a group like this, I think you should have more discussion about the filibuster, but my, what I'm trying to get at is, um, it's a, it's a process question and it doesn't mean anything to people unless they see how the filibuster is helping them block everything to make life better. And we are for unblocking that and for getting them the help that they need. So there are many who say that the Senate was not built for the modern era. We have very large states with very tiny populations who seem to control the legislative agenda. Do you believe the Senate should be reformed to give higher population states possibly an additional senator? Like if you look at California and New York, the populations are huge. And Wyoming and Montana, they're very small, but they are controlling things like voting, um, you know, and policing and the environment and women's reproduction. You don't have to tell me that. I mean, I, I, I represent 40 million people, two senators, senators from Delaware, like about a million, uh, Wyoming, less than a million. And, you know, it's insanity, but it's a waste of your time to even think about it. it that, that has about as much chance as I have right now to become president of the United States. <laughs> I mean, so it's ridiculous. It don't waste time on that. But, but here's something that's worth your time, making DC a state. This is where, this is the battle because they have more people than Wyoming and, and they have so many issues. So that one, I would really focus on. Right, that, that was my next question to you. And also Puerto Rico, do you think both of those? Well, Puerto Rico, I can't answer to because there've been some odd elections there. The last election they said they wanted statehood but it was like a 20% turnout. So. I'm not an expert on Puerto Rico, but I am an expert on DC because you know, we have to run DC and it's it's so patriarchal and ridiculous because you know they know what they need. And as I said, they have more people than other states that that have two senators. It's crazy. Yeah. 
So I have time for one more question for you. Sure. Um, so do you think that any of the current legislation that is sitting in the Senate will get through? You know, one of the things that we hear a lot is if the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act doesn't get through, we will lose the legislatures for, a, you know, the House and the Senate for a generation. Do you agree with that? Um, if those bills are not passed, can we, you know, you spoke about the importance of holding the Senate and the House. Can we do that without this legislation? I think we can, but uh, because here's the reason. We have managed to show in Georgia, even with a rough terrain, that we can get the turnout. And the more they try to clamp down, the more people are saying, are you kidding? We're gonna vote now. Is it harder? Yes, it's terrible. And by the way, Stacey Abrams is my heroine and I hope you can sometime get her on. She's phenomenal. Um, but my view is yes, we can win elections, but I think I'm gonna make a prediction that we will get the John Lewis bill through because Joe Manchin has really embraced that. Uh, and so I think because he's embraced it, it may be that it's one of these moral issues with him where he would say for this legislation, let's just make it a 50, you know, 51 threshold. We'll see. But um, the court, there's gonna be a thousand lawsuits uh, against what they're doing in the States. They've already started. I'm sure you've been involved. ACLU is involved. There are other organizations. Uh, League of Women Voters is involved. So we could see though a lot of, of, of provisions in those terrible state laws overturned by the court. Knowing the makeup of the Supreme Court, it does give me a bit of anxiety, but they're so outrageous. Imagine you can't give someone a glass of water uh, you know, ap ap outrageous uh, and others like that, where you allow the states to get involved in overseeing a recount, this is dangerous stuff. So um, just to put it, to wrap it up, I would say this, uh, our people are gonna vote. They are not gonna stay home. Nothing's gonna scare them. Um, we need to support those that are trying to overturn this, uh, these, uh, these, um, new laws in the courts. We have to help them. We have to give them money. We have to make sure they have the attorneys that they can do this. We have to help groups like Stacey Abrams, who's gonna go in Georgia just in another year, despite what they passed, and if we can't overturn it, and get the people to say, no way are we gonna you know, not have our vote cast. No way, we're gonna, you know, I think of my friend John Lewis, may he rest in peace and taking a, a shot to the head and having a, 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 metal, a metal piece inside his brain. Uh, and, and, and he said, no, we're, we're gonna make this happen. So I, um, I think there's nothing stopping us from getting this done, but, um, and I do think the John Lewis bill will pass. And by the way, what that would do is, I know you know, is it would, it would fix uh, Title V of the Voting Rights Act so that if some of these historically, uh, historically, uh, I should say bigoted counties try to change their laws, they have to be a sign off by the Justice Department. I believe we'll get that, we'll get that back. But I just want to say, since I do, I have a back to back Zoom tonight. I just want to say again, I want to thank you again, because I don't think you get thanked enough. I don't think grassroots gets thanked enough for what they do. And the Jewish community, with all the values we grew up with, which if any community knows what it is to be the underdog, uh, we know what happens. We know about bigotry and prejudice and all the rest. And we know what it means to be first generation. I'm a first generation. And to have the shot at the American dream because you're allowed to get it, we fight for that. And so wonderful for all the work you do in the places in our nation where you have to do it. You know, again, in California, I saw it through all those red years and purple years and blue and bright blue. It's nicer when it's bright blue. So I hope that you will continue your good work. I thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you for being with us tonight. I know your time is valuable and it means a lot that you would speak to the Jewish Battleground Coalition. So once again, thank you for your time. Um, and this was super interesting, but 
Um, once you leave, we're going to go to State Senator Rodriguez of Texas and Rosalie, if you could introduce him. And again, thank you, Senator Boxer. Thank, thank you, all. Senator Boxer. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Rosalie Weisfeld. I'm a coordinator for the Texas Democratic Jewish Caucus. We're uh, a part of the Texas Democratic Party. And I am so pleased today to be able to introduce my friend, State Senator Jose Rodriguez. Um, Jose is actually a former state senator. He served for 10 years. And uh, prior to that, he served 20 years as the county attorney for El Paso County, which has been in the news so much lately. We've heard so much about El Paso. And um, today, when Wendy Davis uh, texted me to let me know that both she and her husband had, were in the hospital, in the emergency room, um, sick with the norovirus. Um, I was, you know, Jose just jumped up and said, yes, I will help out. He was actually in the room. You know, we all hear that saying now, in the room. Uh, when um, the filibuster was going on in 2013, he was on the floor, he was an intricate part of the filibuster itself. And um, not only was he a state senator, he also has served as the uh, ca uh, Democratic Caucus chair in the Senate, and he was also the um, Hispanic chair at different times. Um, and I, we, ha we go way back. Um, Jose actually studied uh, for the bar with my ex-husband and they were roommates for a while when they were in law school um, before he moved into the into DuPont Center, uh, DuPont Circle, excuse me. Um, he, he started out as an as a, as a farm worker working side by side with his parents and his family members. Uh, he's a true uh, American dream come true. He um, is a true Texas success story. Uh, he was president in 1971 of the school body at the um, at Pan American University, uh, which is now a component of uh, UT, uh, University of Texas system. And uh, he graduated from uh, George Washington Law School. I, I would like to now uh, give Jose the floor and let you know that when he was on the floor, there were 350,000 approximately uh, people virtually watching the filibuster in Texas. And now this was something that was going on worldwide. And I know he wasn't aware of it at the time and neither was I, that so many people were tuned in because in 2013, that was only what, uh, eight years ago, but watching something virtually in real time was brand new back then. And uh, there were 8,000 people inside the Capitol, and I was one of them. And so I was, I'm able to, was able to bear witness to this filibuster. And uh, I now would like uh, to give the floor to uh, my Great. friend, uh, former state senator Jose Rodriguez. Um, Jose, um, sure. I would like if you could speak for a few minutes and tell us, set the scene for the Senator Wendy Davis filibuster, why she was filibustering, describe what it was like for her. Um, you know, many of us know she wore the sneakers and was standing on her feet for all that time, but we don't know a lot of the background. So if you could give us that, that would be fabulous. Yes, I, I will certainly do that. And first of all, let me, let me thank you and Rosalie for having me tonight in this very important discussion. As Senator Boxer said, we really are talking about democracy at stake in terms of what's happening, not only at the national level, but certainly in states like Texas, uh, which is just about to conclude a very, yet again, repressive legislative session uh, with the Republicans in the majority. And uh, I think when, when I think back of the Wendy Davis filibuster, uh, that would have been my second session. I uh, started in 2011. And in Texas, we have sessions every two years. Uh, it, it remains one of the most memorable and uh, important experiences in my life as a, as a public servant. Uh, and and uh, 
I, I think the world of Wendy Davis, I, I'm a strong supporter of hers and was at the time uh, when she was on the floor filibustering what was Senate Bill 5, which was one of the early uh, repressive, restrictive anti-abortion bills that would have required doctors to get uh, admission privileges, I mean, abortion provider doctors and others to get admission privileges in hospitals that would have required some very stringent building requirements for the clinics, uh, for Planned Parenthood, for, for others that were providing uh, abortion services. Um, and so it was a very critical bill. Um, all of us Democrats, although we were in the minority, all 12 of us were uh, definitely opposed. Well, except for, except for one senator who is not pro-choice and is still in the Senate. But nevertheless, it, it was a, a momentous occasion. Uh, Wendy, we talked about it in the Senate Democratic Caucus and she uh, volunteered immediately to be the one that would do the filibuster. There were several of us that were prepared to, to do it if she, if she wouldn't do it. Uh, but she really was the champion that we wanted to be there uh, advocating uh, for, for pro-choice uh, in, in that particular moment. And of course, it was very tough for her because while Texas does permit filibusters uh, in the Senate only, by the way, not in the House of Representatives, uh, we have 31 senators and uh, Texas Senate rules uh, do permit people to filibuster. They're very stringent. You, you have to, uh, you have unlimited time, but you have to stand on your feet the whole time. You, you, by your desk, you cannot lean on your desk. You cannot touch the desk. You cannot um, sit down at any moment. Uh, you can't take any breaks to go to the bathroom. Uh, and uh, whether you all realize it or not, Wendy was experiencing some back problems uh, during that time and particularly that evening. So it was an incredibly courageous uh, act on her part to, to do this. And it was as, as you all probably heard, it was 13 hours. Now in Texas, that she filibustered, in Texas, you try to filibuster towards the towards the end of the session, like within the last 24 hours, because otherwise, you know, the session, and she filibustered on the last day of the session, uh, the clock strikes midnight and that's it. The session uh, is sunny die, as they say in Latin, it's, it's over, it's done, it ends. And, uh, and so our goal, of okay, course- I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna ask you a quick question. Just, yes. Um, so when the session ended, was she ultimately able to stop that yes. abortion bill? Yeah, yes, absolutely. It was a very dramatic ending of the session. And, and I think it's worth retelling in the few minutes that I have. Uh, so Wendy starts her filibuster and the Republican strategy was to raise objections, points of order in parliamentary procedure. And when you're doing a filibuster, you have to stick to the, to, to the issue at hand, in this case, this particular bill, this anti-abortion bill. Uh, and the word is germaneness, you know, the, 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 uh, the discussion has to be germane to the, the bill itself and what the bill provides for. If you stray and go into some other unrelated, ungermane issue, then that can knock you out from the filibuster. So you uh, can't read the phone book like they do, you know, you see in the U.S. Senate people read cat in the head or they'll read literally from the phone book. So in Texas, it has to be germane. No, 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 no. You can read. And in fact, Wendy, one of her successes in the filibuster was that she was reading letters, uh, correspondence that had been sent to her by women from all over the place, uh, describing their own personal experiences with an abortion, their experiences with not being to access uh, uh, an abortion and what, what happened to them and why it was so important. It was very heart-wrenching.
testimony essentially that she was reading from letters of, of women who had sent her those letters. So yes, you can do that. You can, she can go over uh, books that, that are talking about the consequences of uh, the kinds of restrictions that were being uh, imposed by, by the, uh, the particular bill, Senate Bill 5. And so she was doing that. But the Republican strategy was to just raise, raise points of order and have their parliamentarian, which is supposed to be, well, not theirs, it should be the, parla the parliamentarian of the Senate, objectively ruling on these points of order. And unfortunately, in that time, even to this day, the parliamentarian in Texas pretty much rules in favor of the, of the Lieutenant Governor and the Republican majority, the Lieutenant Governor being Dan Patrick, uh, a very conservative Republican. And so they raised, if, if, you, if you have three points of order and, rule, and the ruling is against you, that knocks you out of the filibuster. So Wendy had two points of order immediately raised. Uh, there were really frivolous points of order, but one of them, for example, because of her back problem, one of our Senate colleagues uh, that, sit, that sat next to her, uh, Senator Bill Ellis, now Commissioner Ellis in Harris County in Houston, took a brace to, to tie to her back while she's still standing. She's not touching her desk, sitting down or anything. And they made a point of order over that. And the parliamentarian ruled that it was a valid point of order, that that was not allowed. Uh, and similarly with the first point of order on Germanus, on the third point of order, it had to do with Wendy this beginning to talk about the sonogram bill that came up in my first session in 2011 that passed. In fact, Dan, Dan Patrick was the author of that sonogram bill on the Senate side uh, at the time. He was a state senator sitting right next to me. And, and they said that that was not germane to, the, to Senate Bill 5, the bill that was being filibustered. And Wendy argued, well, the sonogram bill had to do with restrictions, putting barriers on women from being able to get an abortion. And that's what these, this bill is doing. So it's very much germane. And nevertheless, the, the parliamentarian and the Lieutenant Governor uh, ruled against her. And, and so at that point, at that point, the Lieutenant Governor then called on Senator Hager, I think it was, to make a motion, which was going to be the motion to pass the abortion bill. Now we're approaching midnight, by the way, at this point, we're about 15 minutes away from midnight. So as Democrats, we started to ask parliamentary inquiries in order to use up some of the time. And so there were several senators who, Senator Ellis, Senator Watson and others who raised parliamentary questions, and that ate up some of the time. The pivotal moment, the momentous moment was when Senator Van de Peut, Senator from San Antonio, who is now retired, but at that time had been in San Antonio uh, for her father's funeral. She was at her father's funeral uh, when this was going on over at the uh, funeral home. And, and she heard about what was happening to Wendy. And so she took off from San Antonio to Austin. That's about an hour and 20 minute drive, an hour and a half drive. Rushed into the Senate floor and then started to raise her hand so she could, so she could ask a parliamentary question. She wasn't being recognized by the Lieutenant Governor. And so this is the clincher. The gallery is full mainly of women. There was a few, males there, but it was mostly women, packed gallery. And it had been very, and a very active gallery in voicing its displeasure in those rulings that were being made against uh, Wendy. And Senator Van de Peut then starts shouting to the Lieutenant Governor, something along the lines of, Mr. President, at President of the Senate, at what point does a woman have to raise her voice or raise her hand, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, 
in order to be heard over my male colleagues whom you are recognizing. And when she said that, it was just a tremendous, and Rosalie can attest to this, explosion of, of, of voices raised that it was kind of this din that you couldn't hear anything. And, and the Lieutenant Governor was trying to recognize a Republican to make the motion to pass the bill, but he couldn't be heard. And then he passed it over to another Senator to, to see if that would, uh, that would help and a Republican to gave him the gavel. That didn't help either. The short of it is that the din and the noise was so loud, nobody could hear anything and the clock struck midnight. So, 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 so Senator Rodriguez, so this was a filibuster used to stop a bad abortion bill. Yes. But, so what are your thoughts on um, getting rid of the filibuster um, in the US Senate versus- well, I, I, I am 100% convinced that the time has come for us to get rid of the filibuster in the Senate. Uh, you know, the filibuster, I, I wanna just amplify a little bit of what Senator Boxer said. The filibuster has used over its history to, to stop the passage of civil rights legislation all the time. And other bills that are favorable towards women or minorities. I mean, there's, that's the history of the Senate filibuster rule. And it's been utilized effectively by the Southern senators. Uh, without, if you look into, into the history of the filibuster, you will discover that that's what was being used. And I would, I would rephrase it in terms of what Senator Boxer said. I would say uh, the reason why we have to get rid of it is because the minority is, is, um, is getting its way over the majority. We don't have democratic majority rule. And she mentioned Jefferson. And when the debates were taking place uh, over, uh, over at Independence Hall, there was a, an issue of a filibuster. They weren't using that term, but they were talking about allowing people to just talk uh, incessantly and stifling the will of the majority and Jefferson and others came down very strongly against that uh, and favoring majority rule. So what we have now, as you remember when Obama was elected and McConnell said, our job is to see that, that uh, Obama is a one-term president and he doesn't pass anything. And so they objected to everything. Now the same thing has come up again. McConnell has said that the job of the Republicans in the Congress is to stop Joe Biden from passing legislation. I mean, here is a president who got elected with over 5 million more, 7 million more votes than Trump. Here is a, a, a situation where across the country, the polls on a lot of issues, a majority of, the, of Americans support pro-choice, a majority of Americans support gun control, a majority of Americans are supportive of LGBTQ uh, issues. And so the filibuster is being used to prevent any progressive legislation from getting passed. And so I don't see how anybody in the Democratic, and certainly I, I get very irritated with the likes of Joe Manchin and Cinema and others um, uh, that, they would join in in preventing the abolition of the filibuster. I've told friends, I would use the Lyndon Johnson treatment. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would do the Lyndon treatment and say, Joe, what are the projects that you would like to get you know, funding for? What are the bills that are your priority bills? None of that is going to pass if you don't support your democratic colleagues in these important issues. I mean, you know, Lyndon used to twist arms like that. And that's, I think that's what needs to be done. I agree, I agree. I do think that we need to get Manchin and Cinema on board. Um, 
One of the last questions I have for you is about Texas, actually. Texas is part of our battleground coalition. It's considered a state that is purple and maybe can go blue. Do you believe we can send a Democratic U.S. Senator to D.C. from Texas? Do you think we can put in a Democratic governor in Texas? And Texas has gained two seats based on the most recent um, census. Do you think either of those seats will likely go Democratic? Well, uh, at least one of them will. Uh, to answer the last part of your three or four part question, uh, at least one of them. You know, we are in the middle, we're gonna be doing redistricting and, and there's no question that the Republicans in the majority of the Texas legislature are going to draw the districts so that they can, they can be assured of getting at least one new one and allowing Democrats maybe to get one. Let's hope that we can at least get one. Um, I think the demographics indicate that. So I think we, we can get at least one of those seats um, secondly, on your question about sending a senator, look, we came within three points, two and a half, I think it was, that Beto O'Rourke came of, of uh, winning the Senate seat away from Ted Cruz. Uh, it can happen again. It, it's, it's, it's very possible. You have to have somebody like Beto that is charismatic, that goes to every single, you know, county, 254 counties in the great state of Texas and talks to everyone, regardless of whether they're historically active Democrats voting or whether they are Democrats, but haven't bothered to vote. Um, that's what it'll take. And also someone that can motivate the millennial voters, the young people as he was able to do. Um, and I think we have several people that can fit that bill. It's not just Beto. So I, I think we we can win a Senate seat. And I, and I do think that, uh, the, the other part was the governor. Uh, just yesterday, it was being reported in Texas Standard radio program that, that uh, Governor Abbott has drawn an opponent, one of my former colleague, Republican colleagues, Dan Hoff, Don Hoffines, Senator Hoffines from, from Dallas, uh, to run against Abbott in the primary. And this is the, the far, far right putting up a candidate against the right wing <laughs> governor in Texas, right? Uh, and, and that tells you that people perceive him, uh, he's made some very bad decisions with regard to the COVID uh, situation in terms of his uh, orders, kind of like the way people attack uh, uh, the governor out there in California. Um, he has, um, you know, he's opened up sooner than he should have. He's put, he just announced that he was doing away with any mask mandates and he's prohibiting local governments, county, city, school districts from requiring a, 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 uh, a mask while we still have COVID. Uh, he's trying, he's racing right now to the far right because he knows there's some problems in his reelection. Now, don't get me wrong. He's got over $40 million in his, in his campaign account, he can raise money. He is still is uh, strongly supported, but uh, he has this uh, freeze that we had, uh, this weather that occurred in February that resulted in a hundred people dying because we, our electrical grid system was not prepared to deal with that, even though they had been warned when I came into the Senate in 2011, that there needed to be measures taken to strengthen the, the electrical grid weatherization and so forth. And it wasn't done because in Texas, you know, they pride themselves, the majority in less regulation. And so these are the consequences and people, it's something that people have really gotten upset about. And so that's gonna be a very um, strong issue to run against him on. Do you, so, believe, do you believe Beto will run for one of these offices, whether it's governor or Senate? Or it, it's, it's, it's hard to say because, you know, he has kind of uh, teased people about it uh, in comments that he's made to the media in running for governor, for example. Uh, people wanted him to run for against Senator Cornyn when that election came up uh, this last time in 2018. Uh, I mean, 2020, and um, 
if he had run, I, I don't have any doubt he would have gotten elected, but he decided to run for president instead. Um, and um, of course, we all know what happened there. So it, it's difficult to say whether he is serious about running for, for, for governor or, or, I mean, you know, Cornyn just got reelected. Cruz has got four more years to go. So really the only thing open for him is a governorship if he's interested. A lot of people want him to do it, but we don't know whether he's gonna do it or not. Great. Oh, well, thank you so much for running short on time. We're a little over. Thank you for filling in at the last minute. We greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. Well, um, you're, you're welcome. Th thank you, Rosalie, for securing Senator Rodriguez at the last minute. Thank everyone for attending this event. We so appreciate your time. You could be anywhere and you're with the Jewish Battleground Coalition. Thank you to all the Jewish Battleground partners. If you're from any of the battleground states, whether it's Texas, Florida, Georgia, Minnesota, Arizona, um, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, or Pennsylvania, go check out their Jewish groups, their caucuses, um, and we together um, can hold the House and hold the Senate and make sure Joe Biden um, gets his legislation passed and we can move forward as a nation. So thank you so much to everyone and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.